boy, Warhammer Fantasy's end times sure were a thing, weren't they? A totally valid, interesting, and respectful way to end a franchise that not only started the company, but had also helped start and grow a massive market of gaming and had thousands upon thousands of fans. Ha! Ah, yeah, right. Even if you only know Warhammer Fantasy is that thing that Total War started milking, you've probably at least heard of the End Times. More specifically, you might know that A, the End Times paved the way for Age of Sigmar, and B, it was quite possibly the foulest thing a company could do to its fans and consumers. And yes, I'm including Disney axing 90% of Star Wars. At least those stories still technically exist in their own little universe, and the ending to 40 years of build-up for them didn't finish with, and then everybody died, the end. Now you might have noticed the quotation marks around the word better in the video title. To be honest, that's because I don't know if anything I can come up with could make them good. By the nature of getting rid of a 40-year-old setting, a lot of people are going to be unhappy and some controversial decisions are going to have to be made. I mean, Warhammer Fantasy isn't like 40k, you can't just blow up the planet and move on. There's only one planet for starters. But I am confident I can point out a few things that could be fixed to, if not make them good, at least make them passable and give the heroes of the setting some dignity to their deaths. Is there a way to make everyone happy? Absolutely not. Also, don't just expect me to say, don't have them happen. Even though its beginning was awful to say the least and the end times was a travesty, Age of Sigmar does have some cool stuff in it. Also, Warhammer Fantasy was hemorrhaging money like it had just been shot. I mean, the setting as a whole was selling less than some individual armies in 40k. Something had to change. Like it or not, that ship was sinking as much as it sucks to have to admit it. Anyways, no sense in getting all the complaining out at the start, I gotta balance it out through the whole video. But before I go on, let me ask you something important. Do you do a lot of browsing online? Do you have anything important saved on your computer? Have you ever looked at the internet? Then have I got just a thing for you because this video is sponsored by NordVPN. You've probably heard of them before, in which case, why don't you have Nord? Do you hate your privacy and internet safety that much? No, I'm not so good with computers, which is ironic because my current main source of income is exclusively gotten through computers, but Nord's benefits are so simple yet effective that even I could explain them. In fact, why don't I do that now? First off, for someone like me who gets scared when someone asks things like how much RAM do you have or have you dusted your computer off yet this year, Nord is great because it's so easy to use. You click the button that turns on the VPN and you're protected, simple as that. Click another button and as far as your IP address is concerned, you're in Germany today. Or Brazil. Or another one of the 5600 servers in 60 different countries. It's also the fastest VPN out there, so this takes no time at all. And not only is it on every major device, Windows, Android, iOS, Mac OS, and Linux, but you can have it on up to 6 devices at once. See, I have it right here behind Tyrion's beautifully pointy helmet. For people with more tech skills than knowing how to turn on a computer, here's a couple more fun facts for you. Nord's got an automatic kill switch, so if the VPN drops out for whatever reason, it cuts access to the web so you don't get absolutely drowned in viruses in the split second the service is down. And Nord Links, which is a cutting-edge VPN tunneling solution that gives you an incredibly fast VPN connection. If you thought I was done, then you must be insane, because Nord has some killer threat protection. Intrusive ads and web trackers? Blocked. No more of that. Download a file? Nord will scan it for malware and will automatically scan and block malicious URLs on top of it. That's right, Nord isn't just a great VPN, it's a wonderful cybersecurity tool now too, just in case you somehow thought you weren't getting your money's worth. And of course, it doesn't just keep your data safe, it keeps you safe. Say you're playing some online game or other, and things get maybe just a bit too heated. Someone threatens to find your address, you know, standard Modern Warfare 2 lobby stuff. Well, with Nord, you're safe from spies, stalkers, and people angry that you use Riot Shield. And of course, if your at-home streaming services aren't great, or there's a game you really want but you can't get it, no problem. Set yourself to be in Canada, or England, or America, or any country on Earth that gives you better better prices and better catalogs. Maybe there's a game that's on sale on a German version of a website but not your home country's. No problem. With Nord, as far as the website is concerned, you are in Germany. Game restricted in your nation? Just have your computer be in another nation. And because your internet traffic is encrypted with Nord, that means your provider can't cut your streaming speed and you're safe from getting DDoS. If I haven't convinced you yet because you plugged your ears and ignored all these wonderful features, maybe this'll help. If you use the link https colon slash slash nordvpn.com slash pancreas no work, which is on screen right now, or go down to the comment section where it will be pinned for your convenience, you'll get a discount on a two-year plan and a whole month free of charge. And if for some incomprehensible reason you aren't satisfied with NordVPN, you've got a 30-day risk-free trial. So use that link of mine here once more on screen as well as the pinned comment while you can. Keep yourself safe and entertained with NordVPN. Alright, let's start the complaint train. But first, some context for those who might be unfamiliar. I'll keep it brief, don't worry. The End Times was Games Workshop's response to the Warhammer Fantasy setting kind of sitting dead in the water for a few years. Fans wanted some lore events to actually happen happened for once, and Games Workshop wanted to make money off a franchise that wasn't exactly setting the stock market on fire at the time. So the writers came up with a revolutionary idea, Storm of Chaos. 
It was awful. So they went back to the drawing boards and thought even harder on what to do and came up with the end times. And somehow it was even worse. Countless major character deaths happened before the finale of the end times. Lore was calmly and methodically thrown into a dumpster and set on fire. And by the time everything was finished, not only was the setting gone, but as of today, several entire armies were just deleted from Games Workshop history. For every interesting or awesome thing like the Skaven pulling the moon closer to the planet with magic before a different group of Skaven decided to blow it up with a big cannon, there was something like the gods of the setting just randomly fading away, because otherwise they might actually do something to stop Chaos from winning. For every intelligent decision, like getting rid of Bretonia, they got rid of two actual armies, such as the Tomb Kings and almost all of the High and Dark Elves. Chaos won victory after victory, even before the Skaven randomly decided to just join them to screw everyone else over that much more. Despite two of the strongest beings, including the one who invented necromancy coming back to life, none of it mattered because Chaos was already destined to win. The writers had demanded it. In the end, despite even Sigmar himself coming back, which on its own was a whole mess of bad writing, but we'll get to that. Warhammer Fantasy ends with Archeon and him wrestling over Galmaraz and falling into nothingness as the rest of the world is consumed by chaos. Roll credits. Thanks for coming, everyone. Look forward to Warhammer Fantasy 9th Edition never. But we have Space Marines in Fantasy now, so it's all good, right? All of this is not even scratching the surface of the awful writing decisions made during the end times. Quite frankly, making them good seems impossible. So I won't be getting into every single little thing GW did wrong and how to fix it. We'd be here for hours. Instead, I'm going to be giving more of the broad strokes of things that should have been done differently, and could be rewritten to make the whole thing feel less like it was a company spitting at its fan base for wanting to enjoy the setting they've grown attached to. Maybe one day I'll make another video just listing as many things possible wrong with the end times later. That way we can wallow in bitterness together like a dwarf complaining that the book is too full of grudges. We clear? Good. Let's get into fix number one, the characters. More specifically, so many characters were completely mishandled. I think the biggest case I can use is Manfred von Karstein, who, in all his boundless wisdom, decided that the best time to betray the good guys was when they were performing the last-ditch effort to save the world. He saw Balthasar Gelt doing his damnedest to save the world, had a good long think, and decided that yes, stabbing someone with an eighth of all magic coursing through them is a wonderful idea. Surely this cannot go wrong. Can't see a single downside to that. Now don't get me wrong, Manlet is a treacherous little weasel and should be trusted with watering someone's flowers, but he isn't an idiot. He knew that whatever the consequences of stabbing Gelt in the back were, they wouldn't be good. Or he would have known if the plot didn't demand he'd just shut off his brain for a moment. A similar mishandling happened with High King of the Dwarves, Thorgrim. Now up until his death, he was rocking it. He slaughtered a Skaven special character all the while listing every single grudge that rat had earned throughout the beatdown. That is the single most awesome and dwarf thing I could imagine. But that Skaven was Queek Headtaker, which even if you don't know anything about him, you can probably guess from the name he was wasn't exactly a slouch in a fight. So Thorgrim was, you know, a bit tired, understandably, and entered a secret escape passageway because by that point, things were still going south for the dwarves. Unfortunately, he made a crucial error. He didn't shut the door behind him, so a Skaven assassin slipped in and killed him. Are you yanking my chain? The king of a race of craftsmen so meticulous in their detailing that they will spend years constructing a single building. A race so thorough in their work that technology less than five centuries old is still considered to be in the prototype stage at best, died because he forgot to lock the door behind him. Who wrote this? Who decided that that was how they were killing this character off? I'm also pretty sure he had runes on his armor specifically to prevent assassins from killing him like that, but at this point, that's hardly worth a mention. Don't think they only misuse characters by making them look like idiots, though. Sometimes they just forgot him entirely. You know Skarsnik, Warlord of Eight Peaks, and the smartest goblin ever? You know what he was doing during the final battle, what the second prophet of the Green Gods contributed to the affair? Nothing. The writers admitted they forgot about him, and he was supposed to be in the final battle eating the Greenskins. <sighs> One of the orc's special character's entire motivation was to find the prophet of Gork and Mork, and then he realized that two gods get two prophets. And yet, no one remembered the second guy. I mean, I know Grimgor was kind of stealing the show by putting Archeon's head firmly up his colon, but still. There were other things like this where characters just kind of put their brains on autopilot if they were even included, but you probably get it by this point. Honestly, I think this is a simpler fix. I mean, for one, just remember to write the characters into the event, but also rewrite some lore as to how the characters acted. Manfred, for example, could have and should should have been defending the incarnates of the Winds of Magic. But maybe in the rewritten version, a demon throws up an illusion, whereupon he blasts it with spooky vampire spells before he realizes, oops, I just hit Gelt. That is admittedly kind of stupid, but one, it's better than what we got, and two, it happened to Sigmar in Age of Sigmar, so if it can happen to a god, it can happen to Manlet. Problem and fix number two, let the good guys win in some way so it doesn't feel pointless. I know that by the nature of the end times, the ending can only be, rocks fall, everything dies, but it would at least make the whole thing feel more interesting if the good guys were allowed some more 
victories. By the time any of the people trying to keep the world in one piece achieve anything, it's either far too late or it's so minor that it doesn't mean anything. When Sigmar's spirit revived into everyone's favorite prince and emperor, he pounded the Nurgle followers that killed Franzi Boy into the dirt. Then the three of them turned into the flies and Nurgle put them in a jar, which as an aside, thank god it was Nurgle who did that and not Slanesh. After all that, Franz Ascendant purified Altdorf of all the Nurgle bad vibes and made it a shining city of light. Sounds cool, right? Well, it would have been if Kislev and half the Empire hadn't already been burned to the ground and the other half was burning. Or when Bellicor got trapped in a ruby by Alariel for being a bit of a dick. Having the first Chaos Prince locked away sounds like a solid dubski, except the Elves' Plan B Second World had been eaten by Chaos, Nagaron was raised to the ground, and Ulthuan had sunk into the ocean. Not exactly a fair trade, two continents and an entire reality for one guy. Even if we know it's going to end in failure, the forces of order should have still been allowed some kind of victory. As it stood in the end times, for every Chaos Chaos army defeated and champions slain, everyone else lost 5 armies and 10 heroes. Up until the very end, of course, then everyone started dying. But by that point it hardly matters if Nurgle loses one of his favorite followers if the world is already exploding. The fat man's already winning by that point, the one guy you killed isn't gonna make a difference. Again, this is an easy fix. As the forces of Chaos are streaming into the world at multiple different times and places they are held back. Balthasar Gelt set up a magical wall so high that no one could fly over it or break through it. Maybe after the magic supporting it was stopped, it could still have held in some sections? maybe even have it be noted as something that didn't completely fall until the world itself did. Now that point leads into two other ones that I have. The first is that Chaos in turn shouldn't have been so completely overpowered. The Skaven, who shouldn't have been in with Chaos to begin with, but that's probably just my personal bias, wiped out a major faction and half a dozen non-playable ones. They got the Lizardmen, Astalia, Talaya, Nippon, they had a hand in Cathay. Now I love my rats, so the fact they went on such a rampage is just great for me. But for the setting as a whole, it just makes it seem like Chaos could wipe out everyone with zero effort so why bother with the rest of the event? If the comic relief rats can own zone a third of the world by themselves, why should I care about the good guy's struggle when it's so clearly one-sided? If Chaos didn't constantly win, win, and win some more, maybe the event would have been just a bit more well-received. The setting is gone, sure, but on its way out, the elves, dwarfs, humans, and orcs left a mark that wasn't gonna heal on the Chaos Gods. I mean, the elven or human gods couldn't have done something beyond just dying off? Kane's biggest contribution to the setting was making the elves weaker, which, eh, fair enough, I guess, he is a prick. But when the only army winning regularly are Chaos, and the only gods who do anything productive are the four Chaos gods and the Horned Rat, it feels pointless. It only adds to the general feeling of Chaos is the only meaningful threat of the setting and everyone else is nothing. I don't know about you, but in a war game I feel like every faction should get at least somewhat equal billing. One of them shouldn't be portrayed as being able to solo all the others with minimal effort. Funnily enough, this hurts Age of Sigmar too, because if Chaos can so easily destroy one setting, why should we care about the next? Because Games Workshop tells us that for realsies this time, Chaos isn't just gonna win, they burn that good will alongside fantasy. The second point I was getting to is that something in the end times should have meaningfully affected Age of Sigmar. Because as it stands, almost nothing the forces of order did had any impact on AOS. The incarnates of each of the winds of magic are the new gods of AOS, but before they were gods in AOS, they were just the incarnates. They had this whole ritual going to prevent chaos from overtaking the world. One final magical Hail Mary to prevent total destruction where all the magic available was put to use to seal the chaos rift. And you know how this caused the mortal realms to form? It didn't. They just kind of coalesced one day because otherwise there wouldn't be a fantasy Warhammer setting and GW would lose that market. We have the gods of AOS because they each ate an eighth of all magic, but even that feels like they had these characters and getting rid of them was a waste of perfectly good marketing material, not because they earned it. Hell, they didn't even use all the incarnates as the new gods. Grimgor just kind of disappeared and while Gelt is a Stormcast now, he got downgraded in power compared to those like Terry and Teclas who are gods now. Beyond that, Slanesh was put in horny jail by the new elf gods. Those two things are really all that carried over from fantasy in terms of what could be said to be a result of the actions of those not aligned with chaos. Chaos. Nurgle, Korn, and Zeech weren't weakened. None of the factions really had any kind of holdout or anything else that inspired the culture of AOS. There's nothing to show the fans of the old setting that it didn't die in vain. The Stormcast Eternals have a few characters that were heroes in the world that was, but they didn't really earn it through specific actions or anything. They earned it by being great heroes. Some dude who gets charged by a troll at the beginning of a battle could be considered a great hero for a sacrifice. That doesn't mean he did anything noteworthy to earn it. As it stands with the end times, whether the heroes fought valiantly to their last breath or sat down in a chair to read the lusty slot made while the world collapsed around them, the end result would have been the same. If the end times were rewritten so that the final ritual directly led to the mortal realms forming, or if the chaos gods were in some way explicitly said to be weaker in AOS as a result of the effort of bringing down the old world, maybe it wouldn't have felt like the entire setting of Age of Sigmar is just a participation trophy for the good guys. Maybe even just something small like mentioning how Gork and Work fused as a result of realizing they couldn't choke slam all of the chaos gods at once. They had to put on the Patara earring so they could give the people's elbow twice as efficiently, something like that. Next point, it also 
could have gone down better if they didn't disregard all the lore they could have. Hey Malekith, how's it going? Finally managed to take Ulthuan back. That's pretty impressive. Sure, it sinks about five minutes later, but still, good job. You know what they say, the 300th time's the charm. Wait a moment, you were always supposed to be the rightful Phoenix King, and you just hesitated at the last moment so you got burned instead? And all the Phoenix Kings after you are actually frauds cursed by Asurian? Now that doesn't seem right. That actually seems really, really stupid. It seems like someone pulled that plot point out of their rear to build fake drama and suspense at the cost of decades of established lore. Ironically, AOS actually retconned this away when Marathu was up in Slaanesh's guts looking for Phoenix King souls, but it was still stupid when it happened. Or how the Skaven never allied with Chaos before. Whenever there was a great threat like Nagash, they went to his enemies and helped take him down. Now they just gave up and were like, guess we gotta help assist Chaos now, only way out. They destroy half a dozen powerful nations, but they can't stand against Chaos. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Threat levels definitely aren't being made up as we go along. Everything here is adding up nicely. I'm being sarcastic if you can't tell. They didn't just disregard old lore, though. All the fluff they built up in the end times was immediately ruined, too. It all gets its turn being put in the garbage bin. Karl Franz didn't actually die in Altorf at first, for example. He said he didn't know it was empowering him when Sigmar inhabited his body. Which would imply that Sigmar didn't just use his body like a flesh puppet at first, but then cut to the next book, and turns out he was Sigmar the whole time. Maybe you don't really care about the lore being ignored, because, you know, at the best of times, Warhammer lore is being mishandled in some way. How about we talk about entire plot threads that were created in a way that didn't suggest they were going to burn the setting to the ground. Vlad von Karstein became an Elector Count. That could lead to a whole laundry list of cool conflicts and narrative threads, and oh, he's dead, and so is the Empire. Hey, Nagash is back and brought the Tomb Kings he didn't obliterate under his rule. Will any of them rebel? How will the other factions react? No, they won't. They all died. All the elves are one faction now. What will that mean in the future? Yeah, you can probably guess where I'm going with this by now. The lore issues are a bit harder to fix because it means the writers would have to come up with compelling plot threads and narratives that actually come to a conclusion, rather than all being abandoned alongside the setting. Or at least don't write them in such a way that makes it seem like they're going somewhere before you pull the rug out from under us. And also, of course, pay attention to the previous lore established, which sounds easy on paper, but Warhammer is so abound with retcons and contradictions that actually putting it into practice would take some more work. Another simple fix here, they didn't need to wipe entire armies from existence. Tomb Kings are cool. If I was into Warhammer around the time of fantasy, I'd still have gone for the Skaven, but I'd at least have picked up Cetra. He's a cool dude. There was no reason to erase his model and indeed his entire faction from the GW web store. I know I would have grabbed some high elf units even if only so I can proxy them into being Eldar, but guess what? Almost all of those are gone too. No spearmen, no special characters, no more flying boat pulled by a bird, the most glorious of models. And to some extent, I do get it, a lot of these armies weren't selling well, even by fantasy standards. But there was no reason to get rid of them outright. GW could have had them become specially made to order, or hell, just mark the price up. Warhammer players are used to being nickel and dimed, I'm sure most of us wouldn't mind paying an extra 10 bucks, that means the models could still exist and be purchasable. The most baffling thing about this to me is that Total Warhammer released barely a year after the end times were all said and done. GW didn't expect one of the most popular strategy game series of all time to drum up some hype for their setting. Like, nah, no one's gonna see this fun game and wanna buy the models they're all based on. People don't have several interests at once. No one likes to play video games and buy miniatures. This fix in the next one would have prevented so much bad press and opinions against GW, which is all the more baffling because of how easy of a pitfall they were to avoid. Here's my final fix, and I'll tell you a secret. I lied in the beginning of the video. My last point is, indeed, don't just blow up the world. Because they didn't have to do that, or at least only do that. One possible ending of fantasy that allows for Age of Sigmar is indeed to wreck the whole place and start over with a new IP. The ending to one timeline, that is. But there's another one. Another timeline that happened a few years before the end times and Age of Sigmar went down. Games Workshop could have gone down the Storm of Chaos storyline I mentioned earlier so they could have their cake and eat it too. You get one timeline where fantasy explodes and you can have all the ground marines your heart desires. Go buck wild. And one timeline where the Empire still stands strong, Archeon is pushed back by an orc headbutting him in the junk, and the world lives to fight another day. I know I said Storm of Chaos was awful. It was. But a lot of why it was awful was because it was a campaign where GW said that the results of player battles would dictate how it went. Unfortunately for them, Chaos kept losing, but since Games Workshop wanted them to win, they just rewrote what happened so that Chaos was actually winning. And when I say Chaos was losing, I mean Chaos couldn't break out of Norska. They do better than that in Total War, and the Chaos invasions of the first two games is nothing. It's Civ 5 Barbarians, as our Lord and Savior Mandalore puts it. People found out that GW was basically just ignoring the rules they themselves wrote, and were a little bit unhappy about it, understandably. Now, for all the awfulness that Storm of Chaos was, it does still offer a timeline where Warhammer Fantasy still exists. If they continued the game in an alternate timeline, 
online where people could still enjoy the setting of Warhammer Fantasy, I can almost guarantee that people wouldn't feel nearly as angry by the end times as they ended up being. As I said before, I'm not even touching on close to everything that was dumb about the end times. The Beastmen as always were treated like dirt and accomplished ultimately nothing, which is funny because they were a chaos faction. The Ogres were just kinda there and didn't really do anything of note. So much to talk about, so much to complain about. But hopefully this was a nice little thought exercise on how the end times could have been better. Not good, but better. Up to like a 5 out of 10 instead of a 0 out of 100. There's only so much anyone can do to save it after all. As always, thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the gasoline to my that one guy who set his entire dark elf army on fire to protest the end times, fueling my rage for more videos to come. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to become a member or subscribe, and either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Pour one out for my man, Altharion. Man marched up to a millennial-old magical lich and started slamming his head into a cauldron like he was Batman. No elf magic or anything like that, just said square up and went to town on him. Shame he got Thanos for his troubles, but at least he's shiny armor now. No, he doesn't have shiny armor, he is shiny armor.